What happened to your arm? Oh, for God's sakes. I, uh, it was a masturbation injury. Hey everybody, welcome to the episode. I can't even go through the numbers, there's so many. 17 of the Hey Kerwin show. We have got a massive show for you guys today. We've got some incredible questions and I haven't even looked at one of them. First question from Instagram. Hi, Instagram. Oh, I, I actually, is that his name? Instagram. No, no, that's no, oh. not true. It's just the, the platform. Oh, the platform, right. I thought it was going to be the Instagram. I was going to, wow, this guy's like famous. He's got his own app. No, uh, Lowen Jen. Lowen Jen. Says, hey, Corwin, what do you do to relax? That's a really good question. Um, my method of, methods of relaxation are a little bit unusual, a little bit strange. Uh, I meditate twice a day, uh, sometimes more depending on what's going on in my life. That to me is a really good reset. Uh, it's, just, it's always important to know where your baseline is and sometimes we can get away from our baseline through the activity and the stresses and you know, the things that go on. And so for me, you know, meditating is a really good way for me to get back to my baseline, get back to what feels my center, what feels like presence and normal so that I'm more aware, you know, consciousness is an ongoing thing, ongoing discipline of when I'm above it or below it to bring myself back. So that's one way that I, uh, that I, that I actually uh, de-stress. Another way that I de-stress is, uh, yeah, I love, like right now my whole, the last holiday I had was, um, actually the last proper holiday, two. Okay, I had, I had a holiday at Christmas in Canada, which was great. I do love to go to Canada with my, uh, my other family. And um, it's kind of weird to say this, but I really do love um, weapons training. Like for me, you know, going out on a range and uh, you know, it's, I guess for some people it's the equivalent of hitting a bag. Uh, I was a, um, uh, I still train when I can. I, I was a fighter for a number of years, almost 20 odd years. Uh, but unfortunately now due to life and injuries, I can't hit bags like I used to hit bags anymore. I can still hit the pads, but not the heavy bags anymore. So I can't go and smash out on a heavy bag to really defrag and de-stress. And so one way that I do like to defrag and de-stress is go and play with some weapons. Uh, and uh, yeah, I do, that is one another way that I like to defrag. And another way that I like to defrag, and this is gonna sound a little bit e interesting, I guess. No, it's not, it's kind of normal. Uh, I love to watch movies. I have literally watched more movies than any other human being that I know. Uh, I love content, I love consuming content. And so for me, one of the ultimate ways for me to spend time recharging is to literally sit on the couch by myself uh, and just, yeah, just watch Netflix or movies or Apple, iTunes, and yeah, I just watch movies. But uh, yeah, for me, that's pretty much it. Sally Gietch Bridal on Instagram. I'm going to just call you Sally. Yeah. Hey Corwin, being a creative, I get stuck in my own head about how to turn my creativity into a business. How, how do I push past having a creative mind and turning it into a business? Well, you see, and that's the thing, and anyone can come up, anyone, well, I won't say anyone can be creative, but creativity is not, um, is not a commodity. You know, there's very little value on creativity. Not saying none, but very little, because where the real value is on the ability is the, on the ability to execute those creative ideas into something that's hard and something that's practical. So I think the most important thing you can do is just realize that creativity on its own, creativity in isolation is pretty much useless unless you're paired up with someone, which is pretty much rare, uh, that can execute for you on a moment-to-moment on -moment basis. But then, of course, you're dependent because if you're a creative who's dependent on someone else to execute for you, then you're really kind of half a glass of full cream dairy milk and a 200-gram block of chocolate when you're really just 100 grams of cocoa. You, know, you need the milk and the cocoa to make the chocolate. Uh, cocoa by itself is not really that fantastic. It's not until you put the milk and sugar in that uh, you've got something special. So for you, you've got to understand that you know, if you really want to do something with your creativity, then you've got to learn how to execute on that. And if you don't learn how to execute on that, if you're not executing, if you're stuck in your own head, then there's got to be a level of two things. There's got to be a level of focus, a level of dis three things, focus, discipline, and motivation. So the focus is on, okay, what is it that I'm trying to execute on? The, dis the discipline being, okay, what is the structure around my execution so that it ensures or increases the probability of me of doing what it is that I want? And the motivation is, motive, root word being motive, or motive, motive, uh, your reason why. Why are you doing what you're doing in the first place? Because if you don't have a big enough reason to do what you do, if the reason isn't grounded in something that is of real consequence to you, then you just won't do it. It's as simple as that. So, you know, you've got to have the ability to focus. You've got to have the ability to, you know, have that discipline of, okay, well, what are the things that I need to do? Because discipline to me is process driven. Because if you can put something into a process, then it increases the probability of you executing it at a very high level. And then you just follow step one, okay, do this. Step two, do this. Step three. And in order to be disciplined, sometimes we need to have that chunk it down mentality when we look at this outcome that we're going for and then we go, right, if I was to break this into 10 pieces, what would be the first piece that I'd have to do? What would be the second piece? And that in itself is a discipline. Chunking things down and then the third thing is the motivation. Why are you doing what you're doing? And that to me is very much rooted in our values, very much rooted in, okay, what are the things that are already important to you? 
Okay, and now let's attach the completion of this to one of those. You know, and don't tell yourself that money is important to you because it's not, because if it is of genuine importance to you, then you probably would have a lot more than what you do if you, do, if you don't have much. And I'm gonna assume you don't based on that, based on that question, unless you're, you know, you're married into it or, or you're a part of a family that has it. So motivation in most cases isn't gonna be money anyway. It's not, it's a, and even if it is, it's a terrible motivation. So you need to be looking at, you know, what are the things that you, like, that you think about, talk about, fantasize about, the things that you do on a regular basis? What are the things that are of genuine importance to you? Not hypothetically or socially, but based on where your behaviors actually fall and the things that you do. And then just start attaching, okay, the outcome of whatever it is that you wanna do creatively executed uh, to those things that are already important. Keep attaching, keep attaching, connect the neurons, connect the neurons, connect the neurons, and then slowly but surely you'll develop a, an, what's called an impulse. Uh, and an impulse is nothing more than a series of connections firing for you to want to do something. Uh, and that's why for me, what I do is impulsive because I've literally programmed my neurology to do the things that I need to do so that I don't have to push myself to do them. It's an impulse. Beautiful. Oh my, thank you, Maddie. Beautiful. Your hair looks beautiful today. Oh, well, thank right? you. Yeah. <laughs> Cindy Church Boyer. Hey, I'm going to call you Cindy. Hey, Kerwin. With starting your business, how do you get people to want to join you? Are we talking clients? Are we talking team? Team. Team. Um, well, first of all, you've got to be someone that is worth following. Uh, you've got to be someone that is worth joining. And to me, you know, we, we've, we, and that's where, the, to me, in the early stages, or in any stage of business, there's got to be a, le a leader that has a certain level of uh, evangelical ability to be able to communicate in a way that inspires others to come with you. Um, because th there are two ways that you can get people to follow you. You can pay them to follow you. You know, you put a job on Seek, people come in, they apply for the job, uh, and then they get a job and they're paid to do a function, they're paid to do a task, and the reason they follow you is because of a paycheck. But the thing is with that, is when things get difficult, things get hard, okay, or other priorities pop up, um, they're going to sacrifice uh, your priorities for the things that are important to them because they're only reason that they're there is for money. Uh, and money can come from a whole range of sources, not just from one business or one person, which is you in this case. Whereas you've got sec you know, number two, which is where you actually create a, uh, you create a movement. Now I don't care if you've got a directional drilling business, a concrete grinding business, a web development business, an accounting firm, you know, create a movement around what it is that you're trying to do. And then you've got to become a little bit evangelical around how you communicate that to everyone, which means that you need to define a few things to communicate because you just don't fucking communicate. Otherwise, you could just sound like a crazy person that's talking incessantly uh, in a way that has no actual substance or no meaningful direction. So what we want to do is we want to define, okay, what is our vision? Now, to me, a vision is made up of three things. How many? Three. Three things. So to me, the first thing that a vision is made up of is number one, what is the purpose of the business? Why does a business exist? And don't tell me that it exists to make money because that is just fucking, uh, that's neutral, that's Newtonian. Uh, it's not, it's not, well, yeah, Newtonian, not the right word, but it's just, there's no substance there. That's, no one's gonna be motivated to make you more money. It's as simple as that. The only thing that you'll, you will induce in someone if you're trying to motivate them to make you more money is resentment and that's not gonna really fly. Uh, so you need to be very clear on why the business exists. It can't exist to be making money. It has to be existing to serve a purpose. And that's what purpose is. A purpose is about serving because you don't do a purpose, you serve a purpose. So when you're very clear on the purpose that the business is serving, then you use that to communicate to the people that uh, are interested in working with you. The second thing you need to do is you need to define a mission or a mission objective. What is it that the business is trying to do in the next five to 10 years? Now that mission objective, it can have money and revenue figures in there, but they should always come last. To me, it's about you know, the, the amount of clients that we want to be serving, the regions we want to be in, you know, the, the, the reach that we want to have, the people's lives we want to be touching. And then at the very, very, very end, I look at revenues and profits. I still look at it, it's a part of our mission objective, but they're not, not the most important things. Because to me, the, the mission objective should be the things that if they are done, then as a natural consequence, the things that come last happen as a natural consequence. It's as simple as that. And the third thing that you need to be able to communicate evangelically, you don't even need to be evangelical, you just need to fucking communicate like you've got a heartbeat, is the values. And the values are things that need to be, they're like the GPS, they're the guidance systems. Uh, they are the benchmark behaviors and traits that you are looking for to be demonstrated naturally and natively in the individuals that you want to be working with, but ultimately they have to be demonstrated from you. And this is where most people fuck it up. Most people when it comes to identifying the values, they go, oh, how would I like to be? How would I like to show up? What are the things that I want to do? want to be, et cetera, et cetera. 
And to me, that's there's social aspirations, uh, and the reason I say socialist because this is you know values are very behavioural, uh, and behaviours are things that are demonstrated obviously socially, and it's how we show up socially, which is around other peoples, that determines their perception of us and whether or not we're congruent with the things that are important. So for us, we need to be very clear on what those are. They need to be originated and generated from within, and if you're not demonstrating the values that you want, then you need to make them a part of who you are, which means you need to start doing them until they become automatic or autonomous behaviours. And the way that we do that is we do them consistently at a high level till they become habitual. I'm talking really fast and I haven't even had any coffee today. Maybe it's working its way out of my system. So three things, purpose, mission, values. And when you're clear on what those things are, you communicate those to your team and in the interview process on a, in a very compelling way. And then all of a sudden you have people that are sitting in front of you who are talent. And natural talent to me is not someone who gets paid to do a job. They do it because they love it. They're just looking for the right home that they can put their bags in in order to settle down and put up their white picket fence and their house and have a few kids. That is the metaphor for settling in into a job for a long term because they feel at home. There we go. Maddie, you and me, you and me. So that's what's required. You want people to follow you because culture, that's, and because what we're talking about here, the vision, okay, which encompasses the purpose, the mission, and the values, those things, when you emanate them, when you, when you ingrain them, they become your, I don't know, culture. They become your culture. And if you look at the word of culture, it's cult. <laughs> so culture is about creating a cult-like following. Uh, and to me, people get a little bit freaked out about the word cult. I just think it's got a negative association because it's typically associated with people who drink Kool-Aid and die or fucking blow shit up. Whereas to me, the, the root of a culture is a movement of people that in some cases, you know, I guess a cult at some levels is a spectrum or culture is a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you've got fanaticism or fa fan fan fanatics, fanatic, fanatics, the fanatic, fanatic. And at the other end, you know, you've got people who are very uh, unfanatical. <laughs> Uh, passive. You've got passive culture and then you've got fanatical culture and the fanatical culture is probably what is most associated with cults uh, and the passive culture is most associated with just you know lifestyles. Uh, whereas what we're looking for is we're looking to be high on the spectrum. We don't want to be fanatics because if you become fanatics then you become jaded, you become biased and for me, uh, by, by, you know, being biased is actually not important. Like you want to be, you want to be making sure that you are fanatical to a degree about your passions, about what you do. But you don't want to become so fanatical that you become delusion. Because if you become delusion, then you stop seeing as much of reality as what you want to or should do in order to see all the options available. So to me, become a fanatic. Get into it. Mix up some Kool Aid, but just don't put poison in it. Bad idea. Uh, this is from Jackson Mayhew. Jackson, I've always liked the name Jackson. Hey Kerwin, hey how, how to deal with regret? Question mark. My first relationship ended like eight months ago and I'm still filled with a lot of regret for whether things I didn't do or say. Yeah, Whew, Jackson, that's a big one. Look, regret is a very, every emotion serves a purpose uh, by virtue of the fact that it exists. Everything that exists serves a purpose, but oftentimes, you know, especially being um, the mammals that we are, being human, uh, we have this neocortex, this ability to think uh, more than we should, and regret is one of those things that it can be quite poisonous. You know, but the, the problem with regret is when you hang on to it, it actually doesn't just poison the past; it actually has the potential to poison the future, um, because it becomes this construct, it becomes this lens by which we start to view our reality from. So the first things first. Um, I've experienced an enormous amount of regret. You know, I've made some stupid decisions in my life, uh, and even still, I continue to make bad decisions. I don't just, I, but I just don't live with regret anymore. Um, because I understand the purpose that regret serves. And the purpose that regret serves is to be a sign, a signal to contemplate and go, right, I am feeling this emotion. What is it? It's regret. Okay, so what do I feel regretful about? I feel regretful about this. Okay, so what specifically do I regret about this situation? Um, and it's not to dwell on the things that I did to feel regret. It's to learn the lessons that are required in order to not have it come up again. And you know, regret is very helpful as long as you learn from it. And regret is very poisonous if you don't and you keep repeating the cycle. Uh, and that's the problem, you know, oftentimes with behavior, is most behavior is autonomous. Uh, you know, it's happening as a result of the habits, which is happening as a result of the thoughts, which are habitual, which is happening as a result of the programming. And when those, when those things are habitual and you have that, 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 that constant that's autonomous, you know, oftentimes we will repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. Whereas when you start to stop, okay, boom, I'm feeling regret. Let's pause for a moment. What do I regret? Okay, what specifically? What did I do? Okay, 
what am I learning from this? What is the benefit of this? How is this, you seeing a pattern here? What is the benefit of this? What is it, how is this serving me? What is this giving me that is making me you know, stronger, better, fitter, faster, more intelligent, more emotionally tuned in, uh, more kind, more generous uh, than I was yesterday? And how can I now use this information to move myself forward to, first of all, think differently, consistently, continuously, at frequency and level of intensity that's required to then behave differently which at scale is then going to produce you know, different outcomes and different results, which is ultimately going to produce less regret. It's simple. Regret is there to serve you. Just allow yourself to be served uh, because otherwise if you don't eat what's on the platter in front of you, they just keep bringing it back. Fucking metaphors everywhere today. Jackson says thank you. Thank you, Jackson. I love you, man. That's episode 17. Episode 17 of the Hate Kerwin Show. Honestly, this has been our fucking action-packed show. My number one question to you is, what is your number one regret in life so far? Let's identify your number one regret in life so far. Thank you, Jackson, for the inspiration. Uh, because I don't want to just do it in isolation. Let's actually identify what this regret is. But most importantly, let's use that identification to identify what the things we are, what we regret about that thing that we experience regret for or feel regret towards. Uh, and then identify you know, what the lessons are. What are we gonna, what is the benefit of this? What are we learning from this? What is it, how is this lessons, how is this learning gonna make you better, fitter, faster, stronger, more in tune, more intelligent, more emotionally aware than it was before? And how are you gonna use this information to move forward to be a better person tomorrow than you were today? What is your number one regret? Let me know below. I really want to know. I really, really, really want to know. Let me know below what your number one regret is. But also, if you have any questions, hashtag Hey Kerwin on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on... All of it. You can actually, honestly, you can, if you're a graffiti artist, on a wall. No, I actually don't do that. I do not want to incite uh, illegal activity. Do it. Do not do that. That's not cool. But oh. if you were to do that, make sure you take a photo of it and send it in. Honestly, I think uh, a majority of the questions that we get, get eventually answered. So it's, it's a great opportunity right now. A great opportunity to get your questions answered. This is Hey Kerwin, where you ask the questions and I spit out the answers. See you next time. Say hi to your mum for me. <laughs>